Hi everyone, you still can hear me? Yeah, nice. Uh, so, Martin did most of my job for the first slide. Uh, I'm gonna tell you about Search UX and how a good search experience can bring up your conversions and increase revenue on your e-commerce website. It's gonna be focused a little bit on Algolia uh, because what I'm going to present in the, in the end, we're gonna have demos. Uh, everything has been built on Algolia and the, the best practices that we're pushing for kind of depend on the way Algolia works. Uh, it's not meant to be CLC, so I apologize in advance if you feel like I'm pushing for Algolia more than I should. My first point is going to be actually on uh, Algolia and UX. What's our take on UX and why do we push for different things that you may have seen otherwise? The second point is going to be uh, going beyond the search bar, understanding that, under, sorry, understanding that search is more than just a search box. And then we'll see different websites that have done things right or sometimes wrong. And I explain what you can do better and what you can implement on your own e-commerce website to increase your search revenue, your, well, your revenue coming from search. So the first point on Algolia, um, Algo has been built with UX in mind and we think we're a UX company first and foremost. And the reason for that is that search is going to drive a user experience on your website through speed. Uh, and Algolia will return, as you've seen, results at a speed that is close to a milliseconds to 20, 50 milliseconds. And that enables uh, what we call an as you type experience. And this as you type experience will let you, or your users actually, see new search results and new filters uh, of each character and from the first character that they type in the search box. That's a whole new kind of search experience that was not existing before and that will open new ways of creating search on your website. But you can be as fast as you want if you're not relevant, it's not gonna work. And our second, what we call pillar of search is the relevance. You have to be relevant for a good search UX to exist. And out of the box, Algolia is going to provide you with this textual relevance that you can complement with business relevance. And the last point is we try uh, as much as possible to be a platform for you to build on. We don't want to be just a search engine. The features that we provide, they're going to give you flexibility to put you in control of what you want to build for your website and the search experience that you want to provide to your users. So you have to think about what you want to do and then you can leverage Algolia to build it. So now let's talk about search. As I said, search is more than just a search bar. Search is more of a conversation between you and your users, between the service you provide, your website, and your customers. And you all know that when you're having good conversation with someone, you kind of want to continue talking, right? You want to continue having this conversation. If you have a bad conversation with a person, you just want to go away and you want to find someone else to talk to. And it's going to be exactly the same thing with search. Some researches have shown that 43% of site visitors go straight to the search bar on a website. And then they tend to spend 2.6 times more money on this website. However, Kissmetrics tells you that 12% of the users who do not find something that they want on your website are going to go to another competitor. And actually what's happening is that they're going to go to Google, type in whatever they, s they wanted to find on your website and end up on any website that provides it. So bad search is going to cost you money. You want to avoid that. And more than that, people remember bad search experiences, just as you remember any bad experience. Well, and people are usually more vocal about things that go bad than things that go well, right? And it's true for any business. E-commerce, which is what you're here today, but media and SaaS as well. Any business you're in, if something goes wrong, people are gonna tell about it. And they're gonna tell the world through Twitter and Facebook and whatever. So you don't really want your search to go bad. Bad or good news for you is today's search power is almost everything. Search is actually a, a way to understand your user's intent. It's going to 
uh, be executing within a context. It might even understand the context and interpret your user's intent to provide good facets or search suggestions, things you know you, you might want given what you just typed, but which are not exactly matching what you just typed. And in other words, when a user starts typing something in the search bar, they tell you what they want and your search needs to provide. So you need to give the user what they're looking for. And you can even go uh, down to personalizing the search results for each and every of your users. This is possible. So this conversation is always going on on your website. And when you start having navigation or chatbots, which are also powered by search features, then you really, really need to get it right. And when you do, you get good results. And these are some of our customers. And you can see that for Birchbox, for instance, on their French website, they're using Algolia, and they've increased their average order value by 12%. 12 they've increased their conversion rate by 9%. On Aftership, uh, it's another kind of things, maybe not so much related with e-commerce, but I guess <coughs> it happens as well. 90% of their search-related uh, support tickets just they just didn't have to, to spend so much time supporting the users on the search because it was working well, well, way better. So does all of that say that search is going to drive much more than just a bunch of results? It's going to drive your conversion, it's going to drive your user engagement and retention. So you want to get it right, and to get it right, you have to uh, think about a go good search experience. So now we're going to look at a few websites. and. I'm going to guide you through what they've done, uh, specific things and best practices that we're pushing for. Um, and, you know, just talk about this. If you have questions, maybe it's good that you interact within, uh, during the each presentation so that we don't have to go back to each website. First, I'm going to start with is Birchbox. So we just talked about this. What they implemented is pretty simple, really, but you're not really used to it when you come from older search systems. It's an autocomplete menu, which first is going to show you some suggestions, like, you know, boutique de Noël. So I'm sorry, this one is in French. The other ones are in English. Um, it's a just Christmas boutique, right? And it's perfect for the timing. I mean, that's something I will want to click on. And that's not really search related, but it's, you know, it takes part. Like, you, you're going to search for something, already giving you some hints as to what you could be looking for. And then I want to create. So I'm going to start typing here. And as you've seen before, at each keystroke, I'm going to have new results. But I'm not going to have a boring list of text only results, right? I've got products that match my request, brands that match what I've typed, categories extracted from the products that match, so it's very relevant. And even what they call Encyclo Beauté, which is th their blog mainly, so showing, uh, showing different articles on, on different creams. And this can happen because Algolia is fast, and, and that's what I meant before, is that the as-you-type experience allows you also to search into different kind of information and with different uh, ways to, to rank that information. To the parameters for relevancy are different, and all of those happen in real time when you type, and you're provided with something that is far richer than what we used to call an autocomplete menu. And so this is the first thing we're usually pushing for. And this is very complementary with another kind of search that you've seen in, in the previous presentation, which is the instant search results page. And the couples have done that very well. It's actually also an, a Magento implementation, but uh, very well customized. And as soon as you start typing, the page completely changes and shows you results with different products all the filters and sorting options. And all this will you know, happen in real time and show you whatever you're looking for. You can type in blue and you're gonna have this. Here there are several things I want to highlight. Uh, first thing is you've got the categories here and they're gonna be, you know, that provided with the product they're going to be real time as well so whenever you click on something everything is going to just be refined and show you what you're looking for oops i'm going back sorry um, you have the price there that is you know a slider instead of 
just an input well a, a text box where you would say like i want i want to find uh, products with this price range it's like makes more sense to have a slider here than to let the user enter something because this slider is actually using the data from the search results to give you an insight into the lowest price and the highest price for the for your search which is 47 and 473 i don't know if you can really read it and then the the other thing is i'm going to zoom in so that you can see something very important is you have to show your users why a result is here so if i look for trousers you can see that as soon as i start typing the letters that i've typed that have matched into the, the results that i'm showing are highlighted that's something that's very often overlooked but very important to let the user know why things are showing up why is it here and sometimes uh, even our customers fail to do that and sometimes they they are violating only in title but they're searching to the description as well so you're going to have results that show up at the very top because they are very relevant but what the user searched matched in the description so you don't really understand why it's showing up here because of course the description is not in the results so highlighting the um, highlighting the text that match the user query is very important and showing the user basically why a result is here is of course very important so that's instant search before it was what we call the autocomplete and our customer jb hi-fi has done something interesting it's done they've done a mix of the two so when you start typing for looking for iphone for instance you have what we would call an autocomplete but it's actually looking exactly like an instant search page that's interesting as well because you, you stay in the context of the page you're in. If you want to get out and, and just read again what you, were look, uh, what you were reading, you can just go back. And this search box over, over here is always there. It's always going to be in your head or wherever you navigate to. And that means search is always accessible. So you can always find your pr the products you're looking for, go back to whatever you were reading and so on. Uh, then the rest is pretty standard. It's just look like what we what we've seen here do you have any questions so far yeah what happens if you uh, so, sorry yeah just uh, go ahead what happens if yeah yeah so the question is if I do a typo with trousers maybe I just forget the e for instance or how do you, does the highlight work? So that is uh, an algorithm feature. We are typo tolerant. And when you do a typo, uh, we manage to match different words. And when the word is matched, it's going to be highlighted. All right. Any other question? Nope. Yes. That's a good question. Yeah, I don't know if you hear me well all the time. Uh, the question is, what is our strategy behind the no results page? Our first strategy is to try to not have a no results page. Uh, we have different features that allow that. Uh, typo tolerance is one of them. Uh, the best you are, well, the better you are at typo tolerance, the, the least no results page you have. And then we have um, a feature that we call remove words if no results that allow you to refine, well, modify the query when the full query didn't return any results and the way it's going to work is if i type something very long uh, maybe i can try this <coughs> yeah still have results actually well i didn't know they actually had this in them either okay uh, let's pick something very ugly So I, I don't know exactly what configuration they have, but I guess they're using this feature, which is when the query is too long and too detailed and you actually don't surface any more results, what we can do is retry the query by either removing the last word, and then if it did not return results, remove again the last word and so on and so forth until you find something, or just make all the words optional. And I guess that's what they're using here because pink is not the last word and we still highlight stripes. 
which means we made all the words optional. Pink was not found. It's no big deal. We found all the rest, all the other words. All right. Is there uh, any uh, semantic analysis? For example, if you type uh, trousers red without pink stripes, uh, is it smart enough to... So I, I did not get your... What example do you say? Uh, for example, if you replace uh, with, with, without, is it able ah, to... Uh, no. no. Okay. Uh, well, funny thing is, it does give good results. Uh, probably bec because of the remove words and no results and things like this. Uh, we don't have semantic analysis. The problem with semantic analysis is we, we are a search engine for much more than e-commerce. Uh, we, we, we want to be a kind of a generic search engine. And semantic analysis depends on context. So on e-commerce and even on different e-commerce websites, the context is going to be different. And one word is not going to mean to have the same meaning in another website. And what we want to fight is the black box effect. And if we start doing things as semantic analysis, we're going to have a black box effect where things work for 98% of our users or 90% of our users. And for the, the sad uh, 2 or 10% uh, for which it doesn't work, they won't be able to do anything about it. So if you want to have something that is not a black box, it would mean having so many configuration options and so many things to tweaks that it's not really helping you anymore. So Typo tolerance uh, doesn't work on semantic analysis, and anything we do doesn't work on this. Uh, it's just uh, pure algorithm, algorithms and uh, data structures that help us pr power that kind of things. I think we had another question, so yeah. Can, can you go to the catch box? So be courageous. on mobile sites and uh, also another question on mobile applications. All right, um, so what we provide is an API, right? So we stop at the data, kind of. Anything that is front-end is going to be on you to, to create. So we, we provide front-end libraries that are, going, that are going to help you build your, your mobile website or your mobile application. But if you want responsiveness, it's up to you. Uh, we can actually show Birch Box. Uh, if we go to the search page, I'm not a huge fan of their search page, uh, but they've built something that is actually responsive. So I'm going to bump that to the right. So here it's the same search page, but then the, the results are, are just laid out a bit differently so that you can still use it on mobile. It's up to you. And then we provide uh, an iOS and an Android SDK that you can use, and they're going to provide the same features, but specifically for native mobile development. All right, uh, I'll try to go on to our next example. Oh, sorry, I am. C can you throw the... Search is done in the category. Uh, does the results should override the category or we should keep in the category? Uh, that's something we're going to discuss in the next yeah. session. Okay. <laughs> Um, when you power your category pages, so your, your browsing, browsing experience with search, should you, when you have that search bar in, in your category page, should you override the category itself and show anything from any category? Or should you uh, respect that choice of seeing products from one category? And my, in my experience and my point of view on this is that you should stay within the category because there was an intent when, when you click on a category, I'm going to show you this one. If I go to gifts, or books, this is what I want to look for, right? It's powered by search, but it's, I mean, for, for your end users, it, it's an implementation detail. They don't have to know that, right? So whenever I start searching within this category, what I want to see is books. Uh, what you might want, if you want to um, increase discovery, All right, uh, where was I? Yeah, what, what you might want to do is include a module like 
uh, things you might like, you know, to kind of expand the search to other categories by showing uh, results that could match in other categories, but just as a module somewhere that is gonna say, hey, maybe you would be interesting in this, in this other category. And that would be probably better and less confusing because if you clicked on books and you see electronic devices, it's gonna be confusing for the user. Does that answer your question? Cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, now I, w I wanted to show you something that's actually not very well done. Um, well, they, they have something I really love, but I showed an example of a good autocomplete before. But here, Compare Munafa, it's a, a price comparator in India, and they're using Algolia. And there is one big problem with all marketplaces is that they have a very large catalog. They, they're basically scraping Amazon, Instacart, and things like this, putting everything on their own uh, databases and their own search. And that means they have a lot of different products that have a lot of different characteristics. And when you're using filters and you're not really taking care of this, this is a very bad user experience because here, uh, and, and this is a search page for iPhone, right? These are results for iPhone search, okay? So can I get an iPhone search that, you know, is a lipstick? Not really, right? So when I click on this, actually what the behavior here is, uh, it's actually showing me lipsticks with a, a nice little bug, uh, which doesn't make any sense. I search for iPhone, right? You want to avoid that. And one way to avoid that is to have your faceting be dynamic and adapt to whatever the user is searching for. So by default, that's what Algolia is going to do to a certain extent, uh, meaning that the facets are, yeah, we have to hold it close. Uh, the facets are always going to be computed on whatever results we're sending back. However, when the results are so varied that you have those many different uh, characteristics for, your, for all those products, then you want to go a little bit further and determine what are the main represented characteristics so that you can uh, adapt the facet list to just what's going to be relevant for your user. And that's what Noon is doing here. So here I'm in the electronics and mobiles category. So I've got many things. I've got games, I've got earphones, I've got cameras and so on. The list of facets is very small. Uh, I guess color does not make sense for all the products they're showing here, but uh, for them it's kind of a base filter that they want to keep on er all the time. Uh, they're not showing anything more than categories and brands because uh, on on that page, at that point, they don't really know what I'm looking for, so they don't want to confuse me with filters that would not work, right? But as soon as I click, for instance, on the Apple brand, then, okay, there you go. So as soon as I click on the Apple brand, then filters show, but not like 50 filters, just a few ones that are pertaining to what's most visible here, which is phones and computers, right? So you're gonna have internal memory, the color is still there, display resolution, your operating system, screen size, and so on and so forth. So that's what we call dynamic faceting. And you really want, if you, if you work on something that has a lot of different products, um, you really want to look into doing this. Okay. Two minutes. Yeah, that's gonna be fine. Um, okay, I'll go quickly over this one. Uh, there is another thing that actually they have that problem, right? They have so many brands. Okay, so this is confusing for a user as well. Like if I don't filter at all, yeah. These are all the brands in the electronics and mobiles thing. So I'm not going to read through this and try to find my brand. So what I want to do is more like this, instant search within instant search. Here I can look for you know, Samsung, for instance, and it's going to look through the different facet values, return whatever is matching what I'm looking for within this facet, and when I click on it, the search is reset, but my facet is set, so I can look for Samsung products, and then I can refine because I want a smartphone, so I'm going to look for a smartphone, which is actually not working well. Sorry about this. That's a, an old demo. The point was this, remember this. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and then the last website that I showed is actually a fake company uh, that we built to have a website that showcase what you can power with search and using the best practices I just showed. So as I'm running out of time, uh, and Julie has been uh, just jumping around over there telling me like I should stop. Uh, I'll stop here, but you can go. It's public, spencerandwilliams.com. Uh, go try it. There are explanations about how things are done with Algolia, and you know everything is powered here by Algolia. So you can try out and see what we believe is a good search experience. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Olivier.